Hey guys, this is Kelly Powers with The Berean Perspective. Thank you for joining. This is going to be a brief response, part one, if you will, a short response to a documentary that has come out recently, which is entitled Once Saved, Always Saved, a Documentary. Now, before I get into it, I do want to say that there are different people in this video that have good information that have been shared. Some of the guys are more known, some of the guys are not. But in the end, what I see this video documentary essentially doing is misunderstanding what it means to be saved in Christ and what it means to be a follower. It seems to be the major two objections throughout this whole documentary are essentially two things. First, a response to Calvinism, or i.e. Calvinists. Second, to another movement which is known as the Free Grace Theology Movement. Now, both these views I do not hold to. In fact, I would not even classify myself as a Calvinist or an Arminian. I actually believe there's a balance of both. I don't classify myself as a lordship salvation or one who would be free grace as well. I believe there's a balance in both. So there are things that have been shared in this particular documentary that are actually accurate in regards to Christians when they become converted, born again, child of God, there will be a changed life. Because why? Because they've been born again of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit now resides in us. We're now going to be being conformed to the image of Jesus Christ, Romans 8, 29. God prepared for us in advance to do good works, Ephesians 2, 10. And we see throughout the scriptures of us being called to serve, to be minister, hands and feet, and God gives us gifts to serve in the body of Christ. So I believe that if one who claims to be a Christian, who completely lives a complete immoral life and has never had any type of change at all, any remorse for sin or any regard to follow what it means to be followed in Christ, I would say I would question whether well, that person is saved. Now, I'm not God. I don't know. But based on what the Bible says, we can test the spirits. We can examine fruit and check things out and see what God's word teaches of what a Christian's life will look like. Again, it's not based on works. We are saved by grace through faith. It is a gift of God. We are justified by faith, and God will keep those whom he has called. I believe that. He who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. So then, why am I responding to this particular documentary? Well, first and foremost, because I believe the doctrine of what's known as the assurance of salvation or eternal security, sometimes labeled once saved, always saved, but sometimes that can be a different type of understanding, I believe is under attack. Now, I don't believe any of these particular men that are in this video are ill-intentioned. I don't believe they're doing it from evil motives at the same time either. I just simply believe they're wrong. Now, I'm going to be going through a multiple-part series going through this particular documentary in time. So essentially, this is a short response, part one, if you will, to their introduction. So let's check it out. So here we go. This is the introduction to which we're going to be looking at. Basically, the first little bit is them talking about early church fathers, church history, the issue of Reformed Calvinism, and what they would say where this doctrine of once saved, always saved came from. They're, these are their claims. I don't agree with them, but let's walk through it together. Lies in the face of the constant teaching of the Bible from Genesis 1 to Revelation's end. The major evangelical voices are saying, you're saved by grace alone. It doesn't really matter how you live after you're saved. I don't know what quote unquote evangelicals that he would be referencing. Now, there are those who quote unquote would be labeled in what's called the free grace theology movement. Not all of them would hold to that, though, but there are those who do. There are others who could say, well, I can be a Christian and just live like I want. Those are the average Joe off the streets. But when he says evangelicals, I'd like to know which evangelicals these guys are actually referencing when they say that. Throughout this documentary, they make a lot of accusations or claims or types of statements, right? I'd like to know who are these specific people that they are addressing we might have our lives cut short as a result of sinful living we might lose some of our heavenly reward but no matter what we do no matter how we live we're still saved i grew up in an assembly which uh, 
taught that, that I've accepted Christ and now I'm guaranteed for all eternity. And the danger of that is that you tend to relax. Once saved, always saved makes the wide way acceptable. We're Christianizing the wide way. We have cut the whole idea of transformed living. We've cut it off at the knees. Exactly truth to what's being said. Because in churches today, this is true. I let my channel, Berean Perspective, I focus on three things. Apologetics, discipleship, and evangelism. Myself, being involved in ministry since the early 1990s, I've been involved in youth, children's ministry, young adults, outreach, evangelism, homeless ministry. I've been an elder. I've been a lay pastor. I've been an assistant pastor. I've been involved in men's ministry and missions. I've, son, I've done lots of things involved in different types of churches over the last 37 years. So I can say, yes, there has been, in some of the experiences I've sure have been firsthand, this lack of what it means to live a life that is actually following Christ. So the, what they're saying, there is some truth to this. But the issue here is, when you are saved, there's going to be a change, right? Years ago, I remember when I was a part of a certain Calvary, some of my roots are part of the Calvary Chapel movement, and I was a part of a church years ago, and the pastor said something profound. The pastor said this, if there's been no change, there's been no change. In other words, if you are now a Christian and you've been justified, you're now being conformed to the image of Christ, the Holy Spirit's now going to be working in your life, there's going to be some fruit. There's going to be some change. God's going to give you gifts to serve in the body of Christ. It doesn't mean you're not going to ever stumble. It doesn't mean you're not going to ever sin. It doesn't mean you're not going to ever fall short time. But God will bring you back. God will get you back up. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. That's the promises of Jesus. He said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. The Bible says he who began a good work in you will complete it. What we need to focus on is, first off, what is the gospel? The gospel is simply this, that you are a sinner. You can't save yourself. You can't muster up enough good works. You can't be good enough. You can't get dunked enough. You can't go to church enough. You can't dress a certain way. You can't read a certain Bible translation. We simply need the grace of God. And when we turn to trust in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, the one who died upon the cross and rose again according to the Scriptures, and all who put their complete trust in Him are saved, receive the gift of eternal life, and God keeps his promises. And in that, we will have a change, transform life. The problem here is these guys are addressing certain specific kind of people. I get that. But they're missing God's faithfulness. Remember the Bible says, if we are faithless, he is faithful. Now, if one claims to be a Christian and outright later on denies, apostatizes, becomes a Satanist, becomes a Muslim or something else, and that's the state of which they would die in, then biblically speaking, we have no good terms to say that person was generally a Christian. If, if they come back to the faith and give their life once again back to the truth, if you will, of Jesus Christ, then we could say, yes, for a time they wandered off, just like a prodigal son. You see, the Bible says they came out from within us but they were not truly of us. For if they would have been of us, they would have remained with us, but they left to demonstrate they were not truly of us. There are people today in churches who have a said faith, a professed faith, a mental faith, something else, but there's not a true heart conversion. So just because someone says the words, those magical words don't mean you're saved. It's first off, have you truly trusted in him? Secondly, does Jesus know you? Because Jesus said, in Matthew 7, depart from me, I never knew you. That word never, never means anything other than never. So therefore, those who are truly in Christ and know him, they are eternally saved. Eternally. The question is, is how do we live that Christian life? And a lot of this documentary, of what they're focusing on, is simply that. And there are, let me say this again, there are lots of warnings in Scripture for false conversions, those who think they can live like however they want. And in today's modern society, we do have that fluffianity. We do have that in churches today where they're not being taught not only the true gospel of what it means to, as Paul says, that the grace of God has appeared unto all men, teaching us to deny ungodliness, unrighteousness, right? So 
we as Christians, one of the things about being saved by grace, grace also teaches us to turn from the ways of the world. Paul says in Romans 11 or Romans 12, he says, I urge you by the mercy of God to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, which is your spiritual act of worship. Be not conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So there are lots of things that these guys are saying in this particular documentary, but the issue of them teaching you can lose your salvation, this is the big contention that I have. I believe it's a lot of the explanation of the hypocrisy in the American church and much of the church around the world today because there's a lot of people that are living like hypocrites because they've been taught that they don't have to live holy lives. I mean, we're talking about heaven and hell. We're talking about uh, eternal life. It's not over till it's over. No Christian life should be judged in advance of death. The idea that you can be forgiven, reconciled, cleansed, now live an unrepentant, sinful life and somehow be a child of God is completely contrary to the whole testimony of Scripture and something that was unknown through much of church history. Again, a true point. If someone claims to be a Christian and lives like hell, all the time. Paul warns about that, 1 Corinthians 6, Galatians 5, and other places, Ephesians 5. We are warned in Scripture that our bodies, actually 1 Corinthians 6 says, do you not know that you've been bought with a price? Therefore glorify God in your body, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. As Christians, again, we're not going to be sinless. We're not going to be perfect. In this flesh, we will struggle. But praise be to God, He keeps us. He keeps on moving in our lives and through the work of the Holy Spirit can help us overcome these sins. But the thing is, if a person claims to be a Christian and they have no regard for the way they talk, the way they treat people, what they watch with their eyes, what they do with their bodies, what they put and drink in their body or smoke or whatever else, or what they gamble with their money, or however they live their lives and are doing this all the time, then the question has to be asked, what does it mean to follow Jesus? Remember, Jesus said, if anyone wants to be my disciple, pick up your cross. You must deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow me. These are things. Now, again, this is talking about how we respond to following Christ. Jesus said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I say? Again, being a follower of Christ is not based on works, but because we are followers of Christ, we will do good works because we are actually followers of Christ than we who live in such comfort today. The first generation of Christians after the apostles were in a unique position to make a bold statement that no generation of Christians ever since has been able to make. This is the faith that was handed to us by the apostles. In fact, the first generation of these Christians were personally discipled by the apostles. Men like Clement of Rome, Ignatius, and Polycarp. They had inherited a Bible that taught people to believe, to obey. They knew no other way in the early church than faithfulness over the long haul. The church fathers. Now, they're going to get into the church fathers here. Now, granted, there are many things that they talked about here, different disciples from the apostles, no doubt. But we have to also be careful when you're looking at church fathers and church history, not to automatically say, well, this is the way it must be. Because these guys are going to talk about the early church fathers, about them teaching that we must keep it on, keep it on to be saved, or you could lose your salvation. Now, in my next video, I'll do more research and provide more information pertaining to the issue of the apostolic fathers, the patristic fathers early on. That is my goal. But right now, let me just make a couple of points as they're going through this. Early on, many of the early church fathers in the first few centuries also taught that water baptism was a part of salvation. I guarantee you none of these guys in this documentary would teach water baptism for salvation. So the fact is that early on, church fathers, not everything that they taught was completely agreement amongst all the church fathers. There were certain things they had many agreements on. So these are things that we have to take in consideration. Now, not every church father taught water baptism for salvation. My point saying is there were also these type of thoughts that were kind of being bounced around early on as well. So if these guys in this particular documentary want to use church fathers, the early first few centuries, as their quote-unquote scapegoat or their checkmate, if you will, to prove that you know Christians could lose their salvation, well, then they also then have to submit to these other things 
that would have been found as well. And I guarantee you, all these people who are in this documentary would not hold to the issue of water baptism, which was a commonly held view early on. Not all of them, but it still was, again, a commonly held view. View. Warned against the idea of of once saved, always saved, because that doctrine was found not within any Christian churches at the time. It was found among the Gnostics. The Gnostics were heretics who denied that the God of the Old Testament is the same God as the God of the New Testament. They also believed that our flesh was inherently corrupt. So when um, Joe just mentioned ago that this wasn't taught by the early church, well, yes, it was. It was taught by Jesus. It was taught by Peter, John, and Paul. We see assurance of salvation, once they always say, in Scripture when you look at it from a biblical point of view. Now they're going to get to the issue of Gnostics. Gnostics were a certain group who they believed the flesh of itself was corrupt or evil. So that nothing good could come from that. But they believed inwardly the spirit, the spiritual realm, that was holy and that was divine. So this is a horrible example, in my opinion, to try to point to these guys, they're going to say this is where it actually originated from. This is really bad on their part. They're really trying to pull a rabbit out of the hat. This is not at all where this understanding of assurance of salvation, eternal security, or what's been labeled once saved, always saved, even though I don't necessarily use that terminology of once saved, always saved, but I understand it from a biblical point of view. But these guys are really stretching what they're trying to say in their opening here. Furthermore, they denied that Jesus had come in the flesh. And John refers to them in 1 John 4, verse 3, as the Antichrist. And in their refutations of the Gnostics, uh, they, would, they would mention how these Gnostics believed that you could never fall away from the faith, that you were uh, essentially eternally secure. Origen wrote about one group of Gnostics. He said, quote, They essentially destroy free will by introducing ruined natures incapable of salvation and by introducing others as being saved in such a way that they cannot be lost. So fair enough. Now, Origen, okay, he's somebody mm -hmm. early on. He has a lot of questionable teachings as well. But this of itself doesn't prove the issue. Again, they're stretching here with the issue of the Gnostics. Again, this doesn't prove it. This is just like throwing out a couple of things as if it's supposed to be fact. Nothing that you could see. I'd like to see them actually quote something from the Gnostics on this issue. Their quote in origin. Now, granted, sometimes maybe there isn't writings for sure back in the day, but fact, give us something. Did they really believe in the true death, burial, and resurrection? Now, they denied his deity. So they didn't truly even believe in the deity of Christ, the Trinity. If you're going to reference somebody, reference people who are from within the church, right? Reference it there, refuting this particular doctrine early on. If that's what you're going to do, don't use Gnostics as your opening start here. Here states, but as to themselves, speaking of the Gnostics, they hold that they shall be entirely and undoubtedly saved, not by means of conduct, but because they are spiritual by nature. It is impossible that spiritual substance by which they mean themselves should ever come under the power of corruption. And see, again, that's, I don't, I don't know what that quote, what's that referencing, Joe, right? What's that referencing? Because the Gnostics believed inwardly they are divine, right? Inwardly they are divine. As Christians, as Christians, we have now been born again. Our spirit has now been made alive. We are holy. The Holy Spirit cannot reside within us if we have unholiness. So when we become a new child, a child of God, a new creation, we are now made anew, afresh, alive. So the Holy Spirit resides in us. Our sin, our corruption is from the flesh. So when God looks at us right now, we are holy, not based on our flesh or our works, but based on Christ's righteousness. As Paul says in Romans 4, it's been imputed to us. Now we are declared and are righteous because of Christ's righteousness. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. He made him who knew no sin to be sin for us on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of Christ. So, the thing is, we essentially are holy and righteous right now because of Christ, but our flesh is sinful. So using the Gnostics here is a horrible example. I would like to see them actually quote actual references from Gnostics and what they believed about the gospel, 
death, burial, and resurrection because they don't believe he's actually in the flesh. They deny that Christ died physically with flesh. I mean, so to use the Gnostics here, again, all these guys, they have good credentials, but this is really, <laughs> frankly, laughable For also it comes to pass that the most perfect among them addict themselves without fear to all kinds of forbidden deeds of which the scriptures assure us that they who do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of god they run us down that is the true christians who from the fear of god guard against sinning even in thought or word as utterly contemptible cyprian said you are still in the world you are still in the battlefield you daily fight for your lives so you must be careful that what you have begun to be with, such a blessed commencement, will be consummated in you. It is a small thing to have first received something. It is a greater thing to be able to keep what you have attained. Faith itself and the saving birth do not make alive by merely being received. Rather, they must be preserved. These last couple of references are interesting. So if you're going to base that off what's just said, the number one back to the Gnostics, they believe because inwardly they were holy. Therefore, they believe because they were holy within, they couldn't do anything would be sinful in the flesh. That's why they believe what they believe when you actually look at what Gnostics actually teach, right? But again, it's a mute point. Here's what I'm trying to say. Here, even when you're referencing Cyprian here. So if you're going to use him, so we receive Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior. We believe death, burial, and resurrection. Now, you yourself have to preserve your own righteousness, if you will, by doing good works, keeping on keeping on to keep yourself saved. So who's saving you in the end? God or you? See, this is the problem with these kind of people in this particular documentary. The onus is on you. Not only so you believe in the beginning, so God saves him, and now the onus is on you to keep yourself saved. Where is the gift of God's promise? Where is the gift of eternal life that Jesus said, I will never leave you, leave you, forsake you. None of my sheep will perish. He who began to work and complete it until the, until the day of Christ. On and on and on. Where are all those promises? Are you somehow more powerful and more mighty than the promises and power of God? That you can overcome that? No. God's word is true and we, man, are liars, okay? We are the people that mess it up. We need to test ourselves to make sure we know Jesus Christ. We need to make sure that we're in the faith. We need to make sure that we don't have a said faith or a false conversion. I get all that. But the issue here at hand is simply this. This is it in a nutshell, the whole documentary. Who in the end saves you? Is it the work of Christ, what he did on the cross and the resurrection, defeat and sin and death, and his promise when you become born again that he'll keep you, he'll preserve you, that you'll be conformed to the image of Christ? Or is it based on you? Is it based on what you have to do? Is it based on you keeping yourself saved by you doing things? See, that's the problem with this documentary. It makes you, and they won't admit this, even towards the end of their documentary, they try to say they're not about works, but it really is. In the end, are you saved by the grace of God through faith, not of yourselves, not of works, or are you based on saved based on what you do to keep yourself saved? For them, it's number two. For genu genuine Christianity, it's number one. God saves you. God keeps you. God conforms you. God works in your life. And he who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. Justin Martyr, I hold further that those of you who have confessed and known this man to be Christ, yet who have gone back for some reason to the legal dispensation and have denied that this man is Christ, and have not repented before death, you will by no means be saved. Absolutely true. If one claims to have been a follower of Christ and then completely rejects him, apostle, completely rejects him, Jesus said, if you deny me before men, I will deny you before my father. That's true. Paul even backs it up in 2 Timothy chapter 2, that if we deny him, he will deny us. So the reality is, if you are in Christ, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 3, no one can call Jesus Lord without the Holy Spirit. And no one can call Jesus accursed 
with the Holy Spirit. You see, if people reject and leave the faith, they were never truly of him. Now, some say, oh, wait a minute, Kelly, you can't say that. They weren't, they weren't Christians. Well, like I said earlier, Jesus said, I never knew you. Are you going to make Jesus a liar? Because if you're saying at some point Jesus knew you, you were a Christian at some point, and you were walking, blah, 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 five years, ten years, and all of a sudden now you departed the faith, and then in the end, when but Jesus says, many will see me, Lord, Lord, blah, 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 I've done this, I've done that, cast out demons, and then Jesus says, depart from me, you workers of iniquity, I never knew you. Many will try to use that text. They see right there they lost their salvation. Jesus said, I never knew you. Never means never, friends. That means he could never say to someone who was a Christian at some point, I never knew you, because that would make Jesus a liar. By the beginning of the 5th century, Augustine, who was the Bishop of Hippo, laid the foundation for the modern doctrine of once saved, always saved. You get then to Augustine, Augustine of Hippo, who starts off like the fathers that came before him, and then he evolves into something much more akin to what we would call Calvinism today. Augustine is the big um, transition figure, no question. Early on, he was not someone who affirmed eternal security. At first, he taught the freedom of the will in his uh, early Christianity, but in his uh, later Christianity, he began to deny free will. Augustine was a, a Manichaean agnostic for about nine, ten years of his life before he became a professing Christian and ended up becoming the top theologian of the Roman Catholic Church. Now, in the early fifth century, a British monk named Pelagius criticized a statement that Augustine had made in his confessions. Augustine had declared to God, grant what you command and command what you desire. Well, this made it appear that everything in our obedience comes from God and nothing comes from man. And rather than admitting that he had overstated things in his confessions, he swung 180 degrees in the opposite direction of the historic faith and declared that man can do absolutely nothing toward his own salvation. He said that every bit of our salvation comes from God, from our initial faith, our obedience, and our enduring to the end. So one of the things I would say in regards to Augustine, yes, Augustine was a big part early on in the 400s and on, especially with the early part of the Roman Catholic Church, which is ironic because he actually did teach election and he did teach eternal security, which Catholicism doesn't actually accept that today in regards to eternal security. So it's kind of ironic on that one. That's a side note. But, okay, so he kind of went against the grain. Fair enough. That was happening often with many people back in those days. Now, Augustine is a big part of what took place later on. A lot of the reformers eventually went back to Augustine. So there is some truth to this. But here's where I dispute. Here's where I dispute. The issue to claim that this is where once saved, always saved, assurance of salvation or security came from, this is, again, this, again, just reaching for the stars. Now, did he play a big part of it to which later would be a part of the Reformation? For sure. But here's the thing. Where do all these people go to? Where do Arminians go to? Where do Calvinists go to? Where do any particular gro group go to? They go to the Bible. So all of us essentially will say, look, our roots should be back in Scripture. So, yes, is there some historical narrative that, yes, Augustine would play a part of this that would later be a big part of the Reformation? For sure. But to say this is where it all began, no. But myself, I am not Calvinist. I'm not Reformed. Never been. Many people accuse me of things, of being such and such. Look, my, my foundation is God's Word. I didn't learn it from any particular, you know, um, ism or whatever else out there. You know, some people did. Some people, other people can be at the same page as well. The point here is this. I want to keep this simple. To claim this is where it all came from, again, is begging the question. It's reaching for the stars, and it's just simply not grounded on absolute certainty here. The pendulum in the opposite direction, more you know, more in the direction of his Manichaean Gnosticism, which had a view that there were the elect among the Manichaeans, and the elect, you know, they were once they were saved, they were always saved. They would persevere uh, in the Manichaean faith, which was not Christian at all. This resurrection of Gnostic teaching by Augustine should have sent shockwaves throughout the church. But Augustine wrote in Latin, and so much of what he said was never read 
by the Greek-speaking Eastern Christians, and they never adopted his theology. His impact might have been much less if there hadn't been much later an Augustinian monk named Martin Luther. In the Reformation of the 16th century, you have Luther, who believes, just like the fathers on this, he believes that it is possible to commit apostasy. He actually comes against the teaching of once saved, always saved, but he did believe that there were certain people that were given the special gift uh, who were the elect, who would be given the gift of perseverance. His view of perseverance seems to be the same as Augustine, that we can never be sure in this life that we will be given the gift of perseverance until the day of our death. For Luther, there was the warning of final damnation for those who fell away and walked away from the faith. So it's really amazing. You have the once saved, always saved doctrine repudiated by the early church. You know, the first three centuries of church history. Just to be clear, that's his accusation, his claim, not substantiated, not true. Uh, you have Augustine picking it up from the Gnostics and bringing it into the church, but only teaching that uh, the elect among saved people uh, will persevere and no one knows who they are. I'm not a Calvinist. I'm not Reformed or any of these type of groups. The Bible talks about God's elect, Romans chapter 8. God's elect are protected. God's elect are justified, glorified, and God keeps his elect. That's what Paul emphasizes from Romans 8, 28 through 39. If you want to teach otherwise, that's on you. But Scripture is very clear. If you are of God's people, i.e. elect, and those who are the elect are the body of Christ, the believers, those are the true followers of God. That's a biblical language. Even Scripture talks about we've been chosen before the foundation of the Lord, Ephesians 1. You go through Scriptures. This is from God's perspective, but yet I do believe we have free will. We can either receive Christ or we can reject Christ, no doubt. But when you are born again you are now of god's people and the bible is very clear he does keep you and god works through you so if you want to call that quote unquote perseverance of the saints or perseverance of christianity then this is true because why because god is the one who keeps you god is the one who's working through you through his holy spirit god is conforming you god is sanctifying you god is doing all these things that's god's faithfulness if you think you have to do all that on yourself. You don't have the gospel. That's a man-centered, works-based, false gospel. You have it going to John Calvin. I think Calvin is the one who takes it even further. Um, like I guess that's what we call it Calvinism, not Lutheranism. Once saved, always saved, as we know it today, actually stems back to John Calvin and his followers. He wrote his work of systematic theology entitled Institutes of the Christian Religion, which is largely built on Augustine's teachings. He says that his whole theology could be uh, systemized through by just quoting Augustine's teaching. The main difference between Calvin and Augustine is that although Augustine emphasized that we cannot know for certain until the day of our death that we are of the elect, Calvin emphasized that there are clear indications in this life. But it was Calvin who basically took that last idea that, you know, the elector gave him the gift of perseverance and said that all Christians, anyone who comes to Christ and receives him, uh, has the gift of perseverance and will be finally and, and irrevocably and inevitably saved. Now, again, I don't agree with a lot what Calvin said. But if what was just said there about Calvin, that is true. That is true. That's biblical. Again, I don't believe in the issue of the tulip. I don't hold a Reformed theology. I'm not a Calvinist. People accuse me of that all the time. But look, if you are of the faith, if you are in Christ, born again, a child of God, a new creation, made alive, have the Holy Spirit dwelling within you, then the answer is yes and amen. God keeps you. God works with you. He is helping you keep it along. It's not on you. It's not on your strength. If you think... If you think you can do this, good golly, friends, then what did Christ come and die, die on the cross for and pay the price and get resurrected for? You might as well hold the old covenant and think you can do good works to be saved. If it's based on you and your efforts, then, then you're not really trusted in the grace of Christ. If you know what the true grace of Christ is, he delivers us from sin, death, all that. Grace teaches us to deny ungodliness, and we will keep on following Christ. Why? Because... We are new creation in Christ. 
trusting in him, not ourselves. So Calvin diverged from the tradition that came before him. He even diverged from what other Reformation leaders taught. But then after him, the Baptists, most of them, I'm free will Baptist, but most of the Baptists diverge with him from the Christian tradition. The Reformed Presbyterian tradition diverges with Calvin from the mainstream Christian tradition. But then when you look at the rest of Christianity today, they don't believe in once saved, always saved, or the certain perseverance of the saints. The majority of Christians uh, in America or elsewhere don't affirm the idea of eternal security. That's just not part of their DNA. The whole Methodist denomination, I mean, the second largest Protestant denomination in America is the United Methodist Church. The United Methodist Church is the second, second biggest of the Protestants? Wow, I didn't know that. That's interesting. Um, here's the thing. They say that majority of Protestant churches do not affirm eternal security or once saved, always saved. Okay, so what? That doesn't prove anything. The majority doesn't mean that you're always going to be right. You know, the majority of people reject the Trinity, who quote-unquote believe in the Bible. Majority of people reject the deity of Christ. Most of the people in the world actually don't believe in the biblical Jesus. Does that make them right because they have the numbers on their side? Of course not. So to say that majority of quote-unquote people in the Christian churches or Protestant churches don't hold to eternal security doesn't prove your point. Now, granted, there are many that don't. I know that. Even myself, with my early roots and knowing about Calvary Chapel, there are many within the Calvary Chapel movement who do not. They call they they hold what's called the abide doctrine, but not all do. Now, the point here is, is that just because such and such claims such and such doesn't make such and such true. We still go to God's word. Now, again, this is an introduction to the beginning of what they're going through. Later on, I'll be responding to their arguments to prove Christians can lose salvation, and I'll be responding to them, responding to our arguments as well from certain scriptures as well, and then I'll have probably a final summary as well. So we're almost done with this opening first introduction responding to them. You have the Restoration Movement, like Christian churches, Church of Christ, they're not Calvinist. And then the Christ is very much a works-based denomination. They are very much in works based. They don't even believe the Holy Spirit can truly reside in us. They believe you must do good works to be saved. They are very much a works based gospel. They believe you must be water baptized to be saved. So again, it's ironic that they're referencing at different times different groups which clearly don't represent Christianity. I find this baffling. Charismatic circles, we would largely hold to the idea of of you can and again look at the little tree here apostolic pentecostalism much of that would be pointing to oneness churches looking on this little tree here again apostolic pentecostalism a lot of that would be considered oneness forfeit your salvation the anabaptist movement almost uh uniformly believes that it's possible for a true believer to uh, apostatize from the faith it would be so again yeah anabaptists yeah true true but not all of them do. Not all of them. I actually know different people part of being in different churches back in the day of Anabaptists who don't uh, believe you can lose salvation. In fact, in fact, I was a part of a certain church a while back because Anabaptists typically what we call Mennonites, and they actually affirmed eternal security. So again, these are these are things they're saying that are not completely true. So if you just listen to what they have to say without doing your own research and checking this stuff out, yourself, you're just going to assume these guys are right. So what I want to say, because even when things I'm going to say right now, I'm sharing things also with you. You need to be a Berean. Don't take these guys' word for it. Don't take my word for it. Check these things out for yourself. Accuse uh, Lutherans, even, or Episcopalians of being Calvinists. So the vast majority of Christians uh, do not believe in once saved, always saved. So again, that's a statement. That's a statement. It's not proof. It's again, it's a statement. This has never meant total perfection or sinlessness. It has always meant faithfulness. Every one of us, 
every single day fall short of the holiness of God. And every day we live by grace and by mercy and by the cleansing blood of Jesus. That's the foundation. The possibility of sin exists until Christ comes and we are transformed into his image. 1 John 2, 1 is the answer to that. If anyone sins, it immediately says there is a possibility that you'll sin, but then you have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Yeah, so if you read 1 John 1, the whole point was John was calling out people who claimed they didn't have sin. That's why he says the blood of Christ cleansed from all sin. He says if you claim you don't have sin, you're a liar. And he goes on to say if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So when we get to 1 John 2, he says, look, if anyone sins, look, we have an advocate. We have Jesus Christ. He is an advocate with the Father. He is the propitiation for our sins. He can set us free. This is not teaching, well, if you sin, oh, you might lose your salvation. Again, these guys are twisting information here that's not accurate. And you can go before the throne of grace boldly. It's a difference between falling in dirt and rolling in dirt. I've stumbled in the 30 years I've walked with God, but the Spirit of God had me to get up and get up quick. Let's talk about the falling in the dirt and the rolling in the dirt real quick. Remember the prodigal son? Remember the story of the prodigal son that that lady was just talking about falling in the dirt and rolling in the dirt? Remember the prodigal, prodigal son demanded his inheritance and the father gave it to him and he went off far away, swindled his money, used it all. Then he was hanging out with the pigs in the pig den, rolling around with the dirt and the mud. And what do you see in the story? The story says that Jesus teaching it, the son recognized what he did and he felt remorse. He said, I will go back to my father and be one of his servants and just go back if the father would take him back. What do we see in the scripture? When the son is coming back, the father in the story sees his son coming. He was looking, looking out, and he sees his son. And what does he do? Immediately, he calls to his servants, let's have a party. Let's go make a big fattened cab, slice it up, have a big meal. And he comes back. And what does his father say? My son was lost, but now he's found. It wasn't he was no longer the son, but he lost his way, but now he's come back home. Here's the point. The father never rejected the son. The son was still the son of the father there. That's the same love that we have when we are children of God. I'm careless perhaps sometime. I immediately, my conscience convicts me. I say, Lord, please forgive me. But I take that sin more seriously. Well, I don't want to hurt my Lord. Recognizing that believers will fail as the followers of Jesus failed in the Gospels themselves is a crucial understanding of the Christian life. We will have some good days and some bad days, but the pattern of our life over time is faithfulness and a steady growth. Faithfulness and a steady growth. I would agree in that proper context. As Christians, there will be growth. And as we're following the Lord, we will learn what it means to trust Him, to be faithful in things. But again, these guys' emphasis is based on you, your works, your endurance, your perseverance, not based on the saving power of God's faithfulness to keep you, to save you, and deliver you. Expect your child to remain the same level physically, intellectually, in every way, always doing the same foolish things. We want our child to grow. You'd be disappointed if your child is not growing emotionally, intellectually, physically, in every way. This is how the Christian life is, from glory to glory. That is God's will for us. So that's where it concludes, and then they go in their part two. So that's where I'll conclude here, going into part two. So thank you for being here. This is a simple opening response to their introduction, the first 13 or so minutes, walking through what they claim, how this all began early with the Gnostics, Augustine, report on all that. Look, there could be some truth here and there for sure, but to say that this is where it all began, it's all just speculation. The bottom line is this. There are many different teachings within church fathers. They're not inspired. Augustine's not inspired. The reformers are not inspired. <laughs> the Gnostics are not inspired, right? 
We go on what God's word says. What did Jesus teach? What did the apostles teach? So when I get into part two, if I get a chance to briefly recap with some information pertaining to early church fathers on some of this, I will. And then I'll get into their part two of what they're going to be presenting as their proof that Christians can actually lose their salvation. So in, re in short, in recap, what do we learn about the issue of eternal security, salvation in Christ? If you are born again, if you are a child of God, if you have become made alive and the Holy Spirit dwells with you, you are eternally saved, not based on you or your efforts. You are now righteous in God's eye. You have been imputed with Christ's righteousness. You are saved and are being conformed to the image of Jesus Christ because that's what God's work is doing to you. He who began a good work in you will complete it in the day of Christ. God is prepared for you to walk and do good works. And through the Holy Spirit, he will lift you up. He will sanctify you and build you up in the Christian faith. So be of good courage. If you are in Christ, you are saved and set free. But be cautious. Don't have a said faith. Don't have a counterfeit faith. Don't think you're doing it just to do the motions. You need to examine yourself, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Examine yourself, see whether or not you are in the faith. Or do you not know that Christ is in you or you fail the test? James 2 says, those who say they have faith, but no actions, he says, that's a dead faith. Jesus said, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, I did this and that. He says, I never knew you. You need to make sure, one thing is for sure about this documentary, you need to make sure you know Jesus Christ personally. Amen? Lord bless you. Please like this video. Leave a comment. Please subscribe. Thank you so much. I hope that you were encouraged today. Until the next time, Lord bless you, and may you grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.